participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me pleasure to welcome all of you to this very important and very significant seminar. And uh, of course, this morning we are very much fortunate that uh, we have an important speaker by the name of uh, Attorney James Foster. Uh, he will be introduced to us later on further. And he came here to volunteer to come to us to share his expertise in the area of programming. And I can say this is one in a million opportunities because uh, it is his first time to come to AUP. In fact, his first time to come to the Philippines. In fact, his first time to come to Asia. And so we are glad that uh, the first travel he has in Asia is going to Adventist University of the Philippines. And for sure, especially to the programming enthusiast, I know that, uh, and I believe that when you come out of this room, you will have something to bring out, to bring. And I also would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to the organizers. And of course, this seminar would not have been possible without you. And again, thank you and welcome. Friends, um, members of the teaching staff of the College of Science and Technology, and our visitors, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, it is a great privilege to introduce to you our guest lecturer for today. Um, as a junior, high, a junior high student in Loma Linda, California, USA, where his parents were on the medical and nursing faculty, our guest speaker discovered the university's computer center and a lifelong obsession with technology. He graduated from Walla Walla College with a mathematics major and minor, minors in history and economics. He then went to law school at UCLA and worked at the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C. and in private law practice in Southern California. In each law job, he was involved with an introducing computers to the practice. After a few years practicing law, he turned to computer programming full-time and obtained a master's degree in computer science from North Dakota State University, then an MBA from Southern Adventist University. Currently, he is Director of Operations for GemTalk Systems LLC and is passionate advocate for Gemstone and all things small talk. In this position, he gets to visit customers in Europe, South America, Africa, and now, as what our dean had said, Asia, specifically Philippines. Earlier this month, he presented at the European Small Talk Users Group in Prague, Czech Republic, and he is visiting the Philippines to teach a class for Texas Instruments. Some of you know Texas Instruments, it's a um, company, and employees who uses Smalltalk and Gemstone slash S to control 
wafer production plants around the world. James, our speaker, is married to Beverly Foster, who is payroll manager for a technology company, and they have two children, John Foster, who is on the mathematics faculty at Walla Walla University, and Laura Foster, who graduated from Loma Linda University School of Medicine and is in a Seventh-day Advent, um, who is in a neuromuscular fellowship at Harvard University in Boston. James is head elder of the Hillsboro Seventh-day Adventist Church. In addition to computers, he is passionate about economics and politics. In fact, he is the libertarian candidate for governor of the state of Oregon. So, friends, um, classmates, and fellow innovators, programmers, I am very honored to present to you our guest speaker, Attorney James Foster. Shall we now give him our undivided attention? Thank you very much. <clears throat> our uh, devotional this morning uh, discussing creation and the creative aspects reminded me of the story of the engineer, the mathematician, and the computer scientist who were discussing which profession came first. The engineer, of course, claimed priority. Look at all the matter engineered into the amazing constructs like galaxies, stars, and planets. Well, the physicist said uh, before that there were planets, the matter had to be made from chaos. And physics is responsible for the matter and the particles and uh, the electrons and protons. <clears throat> the computer scientist uh, modestly corrected them and said, ah, where do you think the chaos came from? So <laughs> implying that uh, we, we sometimes create more chaos than we do uh, solutions. But uh, that uh, isn't what we're always trying to do. I guess the other um, thought that I had from the discussion, our, our speaker was mentioning the creativity that is involved in programming. And one of the classic computer science texts is a book entitled The Mythical Man Month. And this is a book by Frederick Brooks. It was published in 1974. And the first chapter he has is entitled The Joys of the Craft. And he says, why is programming fun? What, what is it that delights its practitioners that they expect as a reward? He says, first is the sheer joy of making things. As the child delights in his mud pies, so the adult enjoys building things, especially things of his own design. I think the delight must be an image of God's delight in making things, a delight shown in the distinctness and newness of each leaf and each snowflake. So Fred Brooks compared the joy that programming gives us to the image of God in us, the creativity that uh, that God has given us, and the joy that that gives us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the joy that I find in computer programming and some of the tools that allow me to do that in a way that I find productive and allow me to be creative. The topic we're going to look at is object-oriented programming and the what many consider the original or primary object-oriented programming language. Alan Kay 
coined the term object-oriented to describe his idea for a programming environment modeled on biology, where many tiny computers, like cells, interact to create complex systems. The programming language he created, Smalltalk, was designed to be simple, elegant, and powerful, and continues to influence software development some 40 years later. In this presentation, we're going to look briefly at that language and at Gemstone S, a object database that uh, is built on that. And so we're going to look first, and you have the program, I believe, at the history, goals, and design. Another one of the early influences in software engineering was Dijkstra. And Ed, Edgar Dijkstra had a article, an ACM Turing lecture in 1972. Again, you'll see some patterns here to the references that I'm making uh, early, early in the era. Dijkstra in 1972 said, the competent programmer is fully aware of the strictly limited size of his own skull. Therefore, he approaches the programming task in full humility. The only mental tool by which a very finite piece of reasoning can cover a myriad of cases is called abstraction. As a result of the effective exploitation of his powers of abstraction, must be regarded as one of the most vital activities of a competent programmer. So again, we have limited brain power, and the only way we're going to be able to keep track of infinite complexity is through this thing called abstraction. The tools that we are trying to use and the language or notation we use to express or record our thoughts are the major factors determining what we can think or express at all. One of the most important aspects of any computing tool is its influence on the thinking habits of those who try to use it. Programming languages should invite us to reflect on the abstractions needed to cope with complexity. So again, the tools we're using drive how we think, how we analyze, how we approach problems. So as I'm going through this morning's discussion, I want you to think about what tools you're using. What tools have you been given? And how does that drive what you're thinking? Hierarchical systems. So we've discussed abstraction, now hierarchy. Hierarchical systems seem to have the property that something considered as an undivided entity on one level is considered a composite object on the next lower level in greater detail. As a result, the natural grain of space or time that is applicable at each level decreases by an order of magnitude when we shift our attention from one level to the next. So we can build things out of smaller and smaller pieces into bigger and bigger things if we can use a hierarchy in an efficient way. So for example, buildings. We are in a building. This is one level of abstraction. But another level would be the walls and the floor and the ceiling. But the walls are made up of bricks or some other material. And the bricks are made up of molecules. And the molecules are made up of atoms. So we have different levels of hierarchy. In computers, we interact with it I'm going to be using my computer for several hours, or a couple hours this morning. And while that's happening, there are things happening inside the computer that are taking 
a much finer granularity, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, and the building blocks we're using. So Dijkstra's suggestion for programming languages, how would you define a good programming language? A good programming language, we shall do a much better programming job provided we approach the task with a full appreciation of its tremendous difficulty. Programming is not easy. If you think it's easy, you're not going to be able to do a very good job of it. You need to appreciate the tremendous difficulty. Provided we stick to modest and elegant programming languages. Modest and elegant is what we're focusing on. Provided we respect the intrinsic limitations of the human mind. Do not imagine that because you're smart, you can do better. There are limitations. And provided we approach the task as very humble programmers. Dijkstra invites us to be humble programmers. Others have commented on the importance of some of these concepts. Iverson says the importance of nomenclature, notation, and language as tools of thought have long been recognized. And you have, uh, as many do, including Walla Walla, combined a math and computer science department. I think we can learn something from the mathematicians. Mathematical notation provides perhaps the best known and best developed example of language used consciously as a tool for thought. Mathematicians are very careful in their definition of terms, in their use of symbols, and that allows them to build abstractions into something that can be manipulated. Iverson quotes a couple other people. Whitehead said, by relieving the brain of all unnecessary work, a good notation sets it free to concentrate on more advanced problems, in effect increasing the mental power of the race. So if you think you're not smart enough, maybe you just need better tools. Maybe if you could make some tools that allowed you to encapsulate an idea so that you don't have to carry the weight of thinking about it quite so deeply. Relieve the mind, the brain, of unnecessary work. Any unnecessary work that you can eliminate will make you smarter, or at least more productive. Charles Babbage, the quality of meaning compressed into small space by algebraic signs is another circumstance that facilitates the reasoning we are accustomed to carry on by their aid. So again, the algebraic signs compress so much meaning into a small thing that you can use it to think of other things. Others have identified how our experiences drive what we can think and do. Someone has suggested we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And I can't help but include an Ellen White quote, it is the law of the human mind that by beholding we become changed. Now, she wasn't referring to computer programming, of course. She was referring to other things. But uh, I think that the things that you look at, not just in the moral sphere and the ethical sphere, but in the job, in your job, the tools that you look at will help you in the way that you think. There's a concept that unless you have words to express an idea, it's very difficult to even think of things that you can't express. And those of you who are fluent in multiple natural languages will have the experience of there's some ideas that are better expressed through one way than another. Returning to Alan Kay, 
Alan Kay was the creator of Smalltalk. We will look more at him in a bit. But Alan Kay dis wanted computers to be an amplifier of human reach. He wanted us to be able to reach farther. And his particular focus in the early 70s, 1972, that year seems to keep coming up, he had a vision of something he called the Dynabook. And this was the drawing that uh, he and his collaborators put together. They imagined children interacting with a tablet, with a touch screen, with the ability to draw pictures. We are close to that reality, perhaps not completely, but my grandson enjoys playing with my iPad. And he's two and a half years old. And I can't help but think of this picture when I see him holding that. The interaction is very similar. He is using it to expand what he does. Alan Kay suggested that there are two types of programming languages. One is an accumulation or agglutation of features. Keep adding features and features. Whenever there's a need, add a new feature. He describes COBOL, PL1, ADA, ADA as languages of that sort. They are enormous number of features. These languages were designed by committees. Anyone that wanted something, it got thrown in. There are other languages that we would describe as a crystallization of style, something very simple, very elegant, typically designed by one person. And Lisp, APL, and for us today, Smalltalk would fit that description. Smalltalk's design and existence is due to the insight that everything we can describe can be represented by the recursive combination of a single kind of behavioral building block that hides its combination of state and process in itself and can be dealt with only through the exchange of messages. Alan Kay wants to encapsulate things and interact with it only through the exchange of messages. Alan Kay had a background in biology as well as computers. And his vision, as mentioned earlier, is cells. And for those of you who have studied some biology, the cell is an encapsulation. And as long as it's well functioning, there's a barrier around it. And things come to the barrier and are absorbed or excreted. But there is, there is an encapsulation. In order to get in, you interact through the barrier with the thing that controls it from the, uh, deals with it from the outside. So small talk is actually a recursion on the notion of the computer itself. Instead of dividing computer stuff into things each less strong than the whole. So the typical computer science approach is make things, cut, cut them into pieces, data structures, procedures, functions, study each of these individually and isolate it. Kay suggests that the, this usual paraphernalia of programming languages is not the right approach, that each small talk object is itself a complete computer. It has the recursion of the idea of a computer in itself. The semantics are like having thousands of computers hooked together by a very fast network. So that interaction of them together. There's a concept now recognized and studied, particularly in the mathematics world, of uh, nonlinear dynamics, but more popularly known as chaos theory. And chaos theory 
presents some things that appear to be extremely complex. The Mandelbrot diagrams or pictures, but are in fact very, very simple rules that are followed in a recursive way. And if you look at it from a distance, you see a particular pattern. If you move in close to it, you see a similar pattern repeated. We see this at work in many things in nature. Again, I think we can give some, uh, recognize the hand of our creator in this. Flocks of birds behave as a group, but do not have a leader. Instead, they follow a simple set of rules where for each one, the rule is very simple. But for the combination of them, the collection of rule, the collective behavior becomes very sophisticated. An ant colony. Some have suggested that an ant colony has as much intelligence as a human and that we shouldn't think of an individual ant as being the entity, but it's the colony that's the entity where they each follow a very simple rule just as the neurons in our brain follow very simple rules, but together have enormous complexity. Bees follow a simple pattern. And object-oriented programming for K was an attempt to do something similar, trying to have encapsulation where we will have simple structures internally that create complex behavior externally. One of the ideas in object-oriented is to have late binding. Late binding is probably one of the consistent advances that we see if we look carefully at computer science in so many areas. The original computer was hard-coded to accomplish a particular program. And if you wanted to change the program, you had to rewire the computer. The advances is random memory where you can put the program into the memory as well as instead of just the hardware. It used to be that indexing and loops was a common construct in programming, but again, in the hardware level with the index register, we can indirect off of a register and not have to have an address hard-coded. Memory management allows us to defer the question of where a program is located in memory. Again, Alan Kay in 1971 was working at the Palo Alto Research Center and one of the head planner at Xerox wanted to have someone do an analysis of trends to see what was the future is going to be like and then how could Xerox protect itself. Alan Kay thought that this idea of protecting yourself from the future was quite misguided. He instead suggested, look, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, control it. Don't worry about what the other people might be doing. Anything is possible. We can control the future. We don't have to defend it. We can drive it. At about that time, Alan Kay and some other people were discussing computer programs, and some of the others were arguing that how large would a programming language have to be? What collection of features would it need to have to be powerful, to have great power. Alan took a different approach. He said, the simpler it is, the better. If you can have something simple, it will be more powerful. So they challenged him to produce something simple. So he came in early for a couple weeks and spent a few hours building what became the first small talk. And his team then went on to create the language, implement it, and make it uh, available to the world. 
His main ideas were these five things. Everything is an object. Everything. We'll get into some details on that. Objects communicate by sending and receiving messages. So one object doesn't control another. There is no control. There is only polite requests. I don't make you do something. I simply express to you my desire to have something done, and you choose how to do it. Objects have memory, that is, other objects that they can relate to, and that they know about. Every object is an instance of a class. This is where our hierarchy and abstraction fit in. And the class is itself an object. And the class holds the shared behavior for its instances, and even the behavior. In small talk, the program itself is made up of objects. So we have objects, we have classes that are objects, we have programs that are themselves objects. Dan Ingalls was the one working with Alan Kay, and he implemented what Alan designed. He describes a dozen or a little over a dozen characteristics. First, personal mastery. If a system is to serve the creative spirit, that is, if it, we are to use it in our creativity, it needs to be understandable. So in order for some, you to be able to use something, you need to understand it. A good design has a minimal set of unchangeable parts. That is, the things that cannot change are very few. It should be possible to change almost everything. And the things that can't change should be very general. And there should be a uniform framework. One of the things that people recognize in communication theory, and you will hear this in your, in your psychology department, is when I have an idea I want to express to you, I can't convey it directly to your mind. Instead, it goes from my mind into words or expressions or gestures or some form of communication. And that explicit communication goes to you. You receive it, you hear it, you interpret it, and then that goes to your mind. There's an implicit from my mind to your mind, but the explicit does not necessarily convey that. And what you hear me say might not be what I think I intended to say. And so the language should provide as clear a way of expressing the ideas as possible. Objects themselves should be the basic building block. And even things that in other programming language like int, bool, and character, those should be objects. So if you're familiar with Java, boxing, and unboxing, we should not have to do that. We should have objects. Integers themselves should be objects. The memory management should be automatic. C programming, for example, has manual memory management. You are responsible for allocating and freeing. And that creates a cognitive load. There are things you have to remember, think about as you're programming that are bookkeeping sort of activities. You should not have to do that. The system should do it for you. Messages. Messages should be a capability of objects that can be uniform across different objects. So for example, the plus. Plus, in most programming languages, is an operator that's part of the language. And it is hard-coded to expect two operands that have certain characteristics. In a message-passing paradigm, we would, expect, we would say that plus is a message that is sent to an object with an object as an argument. So if the receiver of the message is an integer and the argument is an integer, 
than we do integer arithmetic. But plus could mean something else. We could use the plus to concatenate strings. And so plus is not itself an operator that takes integers. Plus is a message that the receiver gets to decide how to interpret. And a string says the way I interpret a plus is to do concatenation. Likewise, you could have matrix arithmetic. And so plus is not always done one way. If the receiver of the plus message is an array, then the operation of the plus would be to add the argument to each element of the array. And then one could do the matrix so, and so on. Uniformity. A language should have a uniform, powerful metaphor that can be applied in all areas. So look for consistency, one idea that works everywhere. So once you understand this idea, you can apply it to everything you find. Modularity. No component in a complex system should depend on the internal details of another component. It should be a building block that is encapsulated. I don't have to know what it's made of. I just have to know that it does it. We need to have some classification system. This is the, to provide us with the abstraction and, and the hierarchy so that we can add new classes that are equally significant and powerful as the base classes in the language. Polymorphism. A program should specify the behavior of objects but not the representation. So we should say what it does, not how it does it. Each system, each component in a system should appear in one place only. Um, you may have heard the, of the dry principle, D-R-Y. Dry is an acronym for don't repeat yourself. Sounds like some of you have heard this. The dry principle is don't repeat yourself. Something should appear once and only once. Leverage. When a system is well factored, great leverage is available to users and implementers alike. And finally, and this is number 13, perhaps the most controversial one, um, the others have stood the test of time very well. This one perhaps has not stood the test of time quite as well. Dan Ingalls defined an operating system as the things that your language doesn't provide, which should be nothing. There shouldn't be one. Small talk came out of the Palo Alto Research Center. Palo Alto Research Center was Xerox, the place that Xerox did uh, their advanced research. And we'll look at some of those influences, but Xerox produced the laser printer, the um, Ethernet networking, um, the graphical user interface uh, uh, was largely developed and refined there. There are a number of early and important concepts that came out of the Palo Alto Research Center, including Smalltalk. In 1980, the initial distribution came out. And in 1981, Byte Magazine was uh, one of the popular magazines, had a special issue devoted fully to that, to the, the new language. So how does small talk compare to a more traditional language, or the ones that you're familiar with, probably? Languages that require an operating system are typically file-based. That is, you do your programming in a file. You edit your file, your program in a text editor. You save it in a file system. You run a compiler, and then probably a linker, 
across it with names of files. You start the executable at a main entry point. It then calls the operating system, allocates memory on the stack, and executes operations, functions, procedures. And then when it terminates, the space, memory space it has goes away and gets returned to the operating system. So this is your traditional model that has a file system based approach. You write the program outside the environment. You pass the program to something that creates another program. You pass your source code to something that creates the program. Then you run the program, these sequential linear steps. An alternative is what we're calling an image-based environment. In an image-based environment, you start a virtual machine with a pre-built object space. And then you simply send messages to existing objects. And those objects respond to messages and do certain things. The side effect of sending a message might be to create new objects. To th there is where your behavior occurs. You can take a snapshot of the image and save it to disk if you wish, and then when you terminate, it's gone. But this is a self-contained environment that contains source code, editor, debugger. All of these things are inside the environment because this environment doesn't assume that you have an operating system somewhere outside and file systems. Everything is self-contained. So what are some examples of this? Common Lisp. Lisp is, a, is the early example and an influence on many subsequent things. Um, sometime asked me about MUMPS. MUMPS is a programming language from the early 70s that is a self-contained environment. A database is something that when you start it up, there are already tables, schemas, and when you shut it down, they remain in existence. A spreadsheet is another good example of an environment that has things in it that are already there, and you just work inside the environment entirely to do things. A virtual computer, if you've used a virtual machine, and even a computer itself. My computer, I shut it down, I start it up. It has the environment. It's self-contained. When I put something on the desktop in a particular place, I go back later, and I look, and it's still there. It remains the way I put it. Likewise, your phone, the icons are in the position you put them. So we'll move along to language syntax. Smalltalk has literals, messages, variables, predefined names, some syntax, block and flow control methods. Literals will look somewhat like you would see in other programming languages. An integer, 42. We represent numbers that have a non-decimal representation as a scale at the beginning, and then the characters uh, representing the number. So 16FF would be the representation for the hex FF. A float has a decimal point in it. A scale decimal. A string has quotes. A symbol is a special kind of a string. Character is, has a prefix of the dollar symbol. And an array has the prefix of a hash or pound symbol with a parentheses. So these are the literals that we have in Smalltalk, literal, object, or literal objects. In Smalltalk, we send messages. The first priority, the first uh, level of message is a unary message. And we have the receiver of the message first and the message secondary. So instead of having a function with arguments, 
we have a receiver with a message. So instead of saying the square root of five or the square of five, we say five squared. So we put the object first. And then it gives us back a value, in this case 25. And then you can send the message as string to the result of the previous message. So 25 as string will be a two-character string with the digits 2 and 5. Binary operators are perhaps more confusing to people who come from a traditional programming environment. With a binary operators, it again is left to right. And that's not just because we're trying to be arbitrary or confusing. It's because it's not really an operator. It's a message. So we say 3 is the receiver, the message is plus, and the argument is five, 4. 3 plus 4 is 12. 12 is the result of the message plus sent to 3. The next message to be sent is the star or multiplication message. So we're sending the multiplication message to the result of the previous one. 12 times 5 would be 60. So this would not be 23. This would be 60 because we're doing left to right as message sends, not as operators with precedence. And then the third priority is keyword. Keyword is where we actually spell out the message in words, in language that is easily readable. So instead of having a series of arguments to a function in parentheses and trying to guess what each one means, we have a word, a keyword, that helps us interpret it. So x copy from 2 to 4 is a single message the copy from to message with two arguments, 2 and 4. If you wish to change the precedence, you can do that with parentheses. Variables, in small talk, we have variables, as many program, any programming language would. The variable we have here is globals, pool dictionaries, class variables, instance variables, Instance variables, arguments, temporaries. One of the things most languages have is a set of reserved words. And in most languages, these reserved words are commands. Smalltalk has no reserved words. There are no commands that are reserved words in small talk. There are globals that are themselves objects, typically class names. So array is not a reserved word. It's simply the name of a class that has some behavior. String is not a reserved word. It's the name of a class that has some behavior. Integer is not a reserved word. It's the name of a class that has some behavior. There are three actual objects that, in a sense, you might think of as reserved words, and then two others, but the three, true, false, and nil. It's not so much a part of the language as it is just the name of an object. There is an object named true that is the sole instance of the class true. There's an object false that's the sole instance of the class false. And you refer to that object by a name. Nil is the sole instance of the class undefined object. It's not something that represents an undefined field or attribute. It is itself an object to which you can send messages. There's nothing special in the language about that object. There's some pseudo variables that can be the receiver of the current message, self and super. 
which uh, might be analogous to this in some languages. There's some other syntax comments are used, uh, enclosed in double quotes. Statements end in periods, uh, separated by periods. The assignment operator is colon equals rather than equals. So we don't have the mistake of doing an equivalence comparison. We use colon equals for assignment. Temporary variables, return operator is a caret, and we can combine some messages with a semicolon. One of the characteristics of Smalltalk is it has lambdas, also called closures or anonymous functions. And these have existed since the beginning, and they're gradually now, 40 years later, being added to some of our more modern programming languages. But in Smalltalk, we can use these anonymous functions. They're enclosed in square brackets. They may have arguments. They may have temporaries. And these are themselves true objects and can be passed as arguments to, uh, to a message send. And when it's evaluated, it returns an object. So for example, at the end here, I have a block that opens with a square bracket, has two arguments, A and B, and then it has an expression that is evaluated. A name less than or equal to B name. You can call this anonymous function with two arguments, and it will return a Boolean. So this is just an anonymous function that can be passed around. So in a sense, in Smalltalk, while we traditionally think of it as an object-oriented language, we can, if we wish, treat it as a functional language, because these are, in fact, true functions. In Smalltalk, we can do flow control through sending messages. Smalltalk does not have any commands. We don't have an if command. We don't have a for command. We don't have a do command. We don't have a while command. We don't have any commands. All flow control and looping constructs are done by message sends. Again, we're looking at consistency, a thorough simple idea that's applied everywhere. So for example, instead of an if command, we have an if true, if false message that we can send to a Boolean object. So evaluating this expression, x and y, is in, x less than y is evaluated first because bri the binary operator has precedence. So x less than y will be evaluated. When x less than y is evaluated, it should produce a Boolean result. That Boolean result is then sent the message, if true, if false. And two blocks are passed to it. And in fact, there's actually no need to have a conditional. Because by the time we're sending a message to a Boolean, the Boolean itself already knows whether it's true or false. And so the implementation of if true, if false for the object or in the class true is simply execute the first block without doing any sort of conditional branching. The implementation of if true, if false in the false class is evaluate the second block without having to do any further conditionals. So we are simply sending messages to objects, and we're getting flow control out of this idea. We can say x and y if true z, x or y if false z. So these are some ideas that we have there. Looping. Again, most pro uh, any, uh, almost any programming language has built into the language a command for a for loop, or a while loop, or an until loop. In Smalltalk, looping is done by sending messages to objects. 
So we have the message collect. A collect message can be sent to a collection, a list, and this block will be evaluated for each of them. We don't have to deal with looking up, counting. In most languages, you have a for loop, and the for loop has to have a counter, and it's easy to miss the first or the last one or run off the end. In Smalltalk, you don't have to carry the mental overhead, the cognitive load of making sure that you write the for loop correctly. You just say to a collection, iterate. Give, for each object, evaluate this block. Collect, detect, inject, select, reject. Um, probably this may not be as well known, but uh, there was a anti-war protest song in the 70s that uh, had this series of words. And so this is a play on that. So we have the ability of doing something like a while loop by just taking one block and evaluating the block repeatedly, and every time it returns true, evaluate the second block, then go back and evaluate the first block again. Methods can have a name, a representation of the signature of the method, and then arguments. So we can say a unary message, a binary message, a keyword message. One of the things languages typically, you can break languages into typing. Is it a strong or a weak typed language? Is it dynamic or static typing? So weak versus strong, a weak typing is something that can be changed. C, for example, has weak typing. In C, you can change the type, cast it to something else. In strong typing, you can't change the type of an object. Static versus dynamic. In static, you have to decide the type of an object at the time you write the program. In dynamic typing, the type is determined when the program runs later on. So, ANSI, there is an ANSI definition of small talk. ANSI 1998, there was one that was defined that provides a class library. So the language itself is extremely simple, but the class library is where most of the behavior is provided and is the complexity. So let's look briefly at some implementations. There are a number of commercial implementations of the Smalltalk programming language. Syncom has, is a company that has a product named VisualWorks. Instantiations has a product, and actually Syncom, I should say, VisualWorks is a successor to the product that came out of Park Place. And uh, Park Place was the Xerox. So VisualWorks from Syncom is the direct successor to that. Instantiations is a company that has a product called VA Smalltalk. That is a successor to a version of Smalltalk developed by IBM, Visual Age. GemTalk, the company that I work for, has a version or dialect of Smalltalk named Gemstone. We'll look at that later. And then there's Object Connect has something called Smalltalk MT. However, you don't have to purchase a commercial version of Smalltalk. There are a number of free open source and new ones being added all the time. Squeak, Faro, Dolphin, GNU, Amber, Smalltalk X, Redline Smalltalk. There are a number of these and you can download them and uh, deal with it directly. So let's look briefly at some of the influences of small talk on today's environment. 
the Apple Macintosh that I am using here today, that uh, many of you are familiar with, was directly influenced by Smalltalk. Steve Jobs, you may, uh, there was an Apple II that was more of a character-based computer and was popular in education environments in the early, in the 70s. Steve Jobs went to Xerox and said, I would like to see what you're doing in your research environment. And Alan Kay said, we shouldn't be giving away what we're doing. And Alan Kay's bosses didn't understand the value of what they had. And they said, sure, go ahead. Show him whatever you're doing. Give him a tour. Let him see anything he wants. So Steve Jobs brought a few of his engineers to Xerox. And they had a one-day tour of Xerox. And what they were shown was small talk. What they saw there for the first time was overlapping windows, mouse, pointer, and a graphical user interface. They saw and they went and they developed the Macintosh. They saw laser printing. The Apple Laser Writer was one of the first mass market laser printers. They saw networking. Apple Machines were one of the first machines to have built-in networking provided as part of the hardware and operating system. All of this demonstration that Steve Jobs got was of the small talk environment from which he was inspired to go create the Macintosh. Small talk has influenced other programming languages. Um, the CLOS, uh, CLOS. Objective C is a superset of C that is very similar to Smalltalk in its syntax and its abilities. Java was created by Sun Microsystems to be a replace or to have some of the same properties as Smalltalk. Python. Ruby is described by its creator as small talk with a Perl syntax. Ruby is, is inspired clearly by that. Swift is the programming environment that I believe that's the one that Google is building to replace JavaScript. And they have hired a number of small talk engineers to help them build it. Small talk has influenced design. Model view controller is something that uh, is a common design approach for user interface. That came from Smalltalk. Test-driven development. This is a practice for developers that came. A number of tools that are commonly used today in other environments have their, traced their origin to Smalltalk. The integrated development environment was something that was heavily influenced by small talk. And many of the people who built some of the early powerful ones, including Eclipse, came from the small talk community. The virtual machine and just-in-time compiling, JIT, came first out of the small talk environment. Refactoring as a computer science idea and process and tools came from the small talk community. Reflection, the be ability to examine an object and understand things about it, is something that is inspired extensively by the powerful capabilities in small talk. Small talk's influence on process, agile methods. The first Scrum project was a small talk project. The first XP, or extreme programming, project was the Chrysler comp compensation system. And that was a small talk gemstone project. Rapid prototyping, software patterns. Ward Cunningham is one of the leaders in the patterns community. He came out of the small talk community. He's the developer of the wiki 
Ward Cunningham developed the wiki, as you may have heard of Wikipedia. Design patterns. Design patterns is a very big concept in computer programming. One of the most best-selling books in the last two or three decades is a book entitled Design Patterns. And there's four authors, and it's typically referred to as the Gang of Four. And one of the authors, Ralph Johnson, uh, is particularly important in the small talk community. And the other authors were very familiar with small talk. And many of the examples in this most popular book in computer science are in small talk, describing patterns. OK. I am used to, in presentations, allowing a break so that people can stretch their legs, get a little bit of water, and uh, uh, take a moment to do what you need to do. We had said it would be 10 minutes. We started a little bit late, but I don't know that I'll need all the time. Um, do you want to suggest uh, how long and when, when we reconvene and how? OK, um, maybe we can have a 10-minute break. Please uh, come back after 10 minutes, OK? Thank mm -hmm. you. 